don't have Pastor Steve and Laura this morning. Uh, they are on a well-deserved vacation. Happy for them. I hope they're having a lovely time. Um, I have the honor of introducing our guest uh, speaker today. And I apologize. I don't have my glasses. I <laughs> put this in a pretty small font, Bruce. But um, I remember much of it. <laughs> Uh, Bruce Osborne is our speaker today. I recall that he's been in, in uh, full-time pastoral ministry since 1998. Bruce and Kim um, have, were uh, members here uh, in 2006 to 2011, regular attenders and now alumni. And uh, just learned a little bit about Bruce this morning um, on a trip to Ch Chile. And uh, right now he's at uh, the YMCA and in uh, Commonwealth. So please welcome Bruce Osborne. Thank you, David. Uh, it is good to be back uh, here at Crossroads. Uh, to see many new faces, some some old friends. Um, it's a joy to come back, and I, I appreciate the honor, the opportunity that uh, while Steve and Laura are out that. Uh, he would invite me to come and share with you this morning. Um, just a little bit about, um, for those that may not know me, I've, uh, as David said, we were part of Crossroads for our first five years, I guess, here in Wisconsin. Um, we moved up here 16 years ago to start the ministry at uh, the YMCA in, uh, in Oconomowoc, Paps Farms, uh, as a chaplain, um, director of spiritual development. Uh, to be honest with you, um, when we moved up here, we thought we would be here for a couple years, and then we would move back closer to family. Um, God's plans are always different than our plans. Um, and so to be here uh, 16 years, we've seen God do a lot of great things uh, through the Y, uh, through people that have um, been a part of the staff, been a part of our membership at the Y, uh, to be able to lead mission teams, um, both to... Uh, orphanage in Mexico, which I'll mention in just a minute, because maybe there's an opportunity for you. Uh, and also, as, as David uh, said, um, uh, been a part of the YMCA in Valparaiso, Chile, uh, as a partner Y, and uh, have taken a team down there and just came back a couple weeks ago, uh, which we'll talk a little bit about um, in, in the message this morning. I did mention the, uh, uh, the mission opportunity. Uh, we will take our fifth uh, mission team to Esperanza Viva. Somebody, some of you may have heard of Esperanza Viva. Um, it's an orphanage or youth home outside of Puebla, Mexico. Um, we've had uh, great opportunities to, to love on the kids down there and support the staff. We even as a YMCA commissioned a former staff member to go and serve full time as a missionary. I don't know of any YMCA in the country that has commissioned a missionary. Um, to go serve full time in, a, in an international setting. So um, we'll go down and support her um, and the other staff and love on the kids for a while. If you would like to go with us, you can. Um, you don't have to be a member of the line. Matter of fact, we're taking, I've got two team members already from Green Bay. I've got one team member from Houston, Texas. Um, and we'll do the team training virtually like uh, the world has turned uh, in the last few years. Um, so you don't have to be a part of the Y. Anybody can go. And if you'd like to, be a, 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 to step into a, a mission experience, be a part of a, a short-term mission team, uh, contact me. Um, I would love to have you go as part of that team. So um, let me say, let me commend you for being here when Pastor Steve and Laura are out. Usually the, that's an opportunity to push the snooze button a, little, a few more times. And so... Uh, you being here this morning shows your faithfulness, so thank you for being here, and thank you for being a part of this opportunity this morning for, uh, for me to share with you. I want to share a message with you this morning that um, has been on my heart, um, really, as, as I mentioned, I was in Chile a couple weeks ago, and um, had an opportunity to relive a, a rescue story um, that I'll talk with uh, you a little bit about, kind of where this message was birthed. Um, in my heart. Um, you're probably familiar, although you probably haven't thought about it in a while, you're probably familiar with the story of the what has come to be known as the Chilean Minor Rescue. Um, 
back in 2010. Let me take you back a few years for those of you that maybe don't remember or don't recall all of the events of that, uh, that tragic event. Um, it was in August of 2010 when uh, six, or excuse me, 33 miners entered the mine, a normal day for them. Uh, matter of fact, probably the day started like most, uh, every other day that starts, uh, starts for them as they go to work their shift in the mine. They probably um, had normal routines, probably the same people that they worked with the day before and that they figured that they would probably be working with in the days to follow. Uh, they traveled the same path to the mine, probably the same type of conversations that were happening, um, continued conversations maybe from the previous day. And I would assume there was probably some laughter and probably uh, the normal prayers that happened um, on their way to the mine for their safety. Their trip would take them uh, over 2,000 feet below the surface of the earth. Once they reached that bottom of that shaft um, at, below, at well over 2,000 feet below the earth, then they would travel uh, a little over three miles um, to the point where they would be digging. Let's just say that they were a long way from home when they got to their point where they were gonna uh, work for the day. And then came what we know is one of the greatest catastrophes, one of the most tragic events in mining, recent mining history. Their worst fear, I'm sure that every day they probably thought about that, and this day their, their worst fear was gonna come true. Probably started as a small crack, um, a shaking of the earth, a shaking of the tunnels, and suddenly the earth gave way and the rocks collapsed, trapping these 33 men. You're probably familiar with the rest of the story, but there's a lot of, as I was reading on the history of this, I, I was amazed at some of the, um, the different nuances of it that we probably don't remember or maybe didn't even hear. Um, known as the San, San Jose Gold and Copper Mine in Northern Chile, the town of Copiapo, um, one of the interesting things about this is when the collapse happened, for 17 days, the world didn't know if these miners were alive. So up on the surface began to develop this city called Camp Hope. And so the families and the friends and the community all felt like they had hope that these men were still alive. So during their during those 17 days that they didn't know they were drilling, they were trying to figure out if, where the men were and if there was any life down there. So they were sending probes down, they were drilling and sending probes down, and finally, 17 days after the collapse, they pulled one of those probes up, and on it was a note that it said, Estamos bien en el refugio. Now you know what that means, don't you? <laughs> I didn't know what it meant, I had to look it up. So what that, what that translates is, we are all well in the shelter, all 33 of us. And I'm sure that Camp Hope erupted with great hope, with jubilation, knowing that the men were still alive. After 17 days of no contact at all, they knew that their family, their friends were still alive. We love a story of rescue. We love to hear about how rescue happens, about how good good comes out of bad. And for this, this community, this, um, these families, these friends, they were getting ready to experience. They, were, they had hope restored that a rescue was going to happen. And then on October the 12th and the 13th, that rescue took place. The men, after uh, many, much digging and much Research of how they were going to, how this was going to happen. This is what happened. They started to pull the men. It took them two days to get all 33 men out, one at a time, in a capsule that was actually um, developed from NASA. And so, one at a time, from 2,500 feet down, they started to pull the men up. And like I said, we love to hear the story of a great rescue. Well, this morning I want to share with us a story of rescue, how we have been rescued, 
share with you the words of God through the prophet Zephaniah. Yes, Zephaniah, it's in the Old Testament. And if you're like me, you'll probably struggle to find that book. It's in the latter part of the Old Testament. It's just three short chapters. Uh, so the, the passage that we'll focus on will eventually appear on the screen. It's Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 14 through 17. And if you want to look it up in your copy of God's Word, you can, or in the Bible app. Um, but let me give you a quick background to who Zephaniah is. And we'll just call him Zeph for short um, today. So Zeph was a prophet um, in the Old Testament, of course. Most scholars believing that he prophesied sometime during the reign of King Josiah, somewhere between 635 and 625 B.C. Over 600 years before Christ ever walked on the earth, before God ever sent Jesus to be um, here on the earth. A prophet, as we know, was somebody who was a voice of God. A prophet was a person that usually more times than not brought a message of judgment to God's people. Zeph was a message, a messenger who not only brought a message of that judgment, but also one of encouragement. He was sort of the bad, not, bad news, good, not, good news guy. And in judgment, his message specifically was pertaining to Judah and Jerusalem and the surrounding nations of that day. And he was God's voice, a message that would, that would come out as uh, calling the people to repentance, to return to the Lord. And that message that we're going to look at today not only was a message of repentance, a message of judgment if the people didn't repent, but it was also a message that would promise or give the, God, give the people God's promise. Most of the Old Testament prophets would deliver that message of judgment and then they would follow that up with, if there is repentance, then God's promise is this. So today I want you to know, first of all, that although we're going to look at Zeph's encouragement, what he shared as God's promises, I want us to know, I want us to understand that we serve a just God and that this just God that we serve will not only be our final judge, but he will be the judge for all of humanity. We cannot lose sight of that fact. And when we look at the character of God, we cannot minimize the fact that there's a holy God and God will judge the sin of this world. My sin and your sin. So when we look at the message of Zeph, we understand that, yes, there's that judgment part. We have to take that as part of God's character. But if we are following in our faith and listening to the word of God, then God's promises are evident to us. God's promises are just that. They are promised to us and we can claim those. So I want today to, I want to spend a few moments focusing on the proclamation of God's goodness and his blessings that Zeph prophesied about in this passage. So let me just say this about the Old Testament. Sometimes we look at the Old Testament and say, well, that was for God's chosen people, the nation of Israel. And while that is true, there is a thread throughout the Old Testament of the Messiah that would come. And the God that spoke to the nation of Israel is the same God that we worship today as a holy God. And so the message is that we look in the Old Testament and we, we see the, the judgment. We see the promises that are given as a result of that repentance. We know we can claim those as well today. As God's chosen people. So I don't want you to ever minimize the Old Testament and say, well, that was for a different time, a different culture, a different nation, a different group of people, because the principles that God laid out in the Old Testament are the same principles we find in the New Testament for those of us of faith. So we get to claim those promises just like the nation of Israel did. Yeah, he was speaking directly to his people. But the principles are there and we get to claim those as well. So as we look at the Old Testament and the prophecy that was taking place uh, through the prophet of Zephaniah, I want us to hear what God would say to us today. So again, we're going to look at Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 14 through 17. Let me read those verses for us. They should appear on the screen. You can follow along. It says, sing. Daughter Zion, 
Shout aloud, Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all of your heart, daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. On that day, they will say to Jerusalem, Do not fear, Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. So today, if you don't hear anything else from this time together, I want you to hear that there's a God who loves you and that he is on a rescue mission for you. And in this passage, I want us to understand that we have several things that, that Zephaniah talks about. We can claim them as our promises as well. The first thing he says there is that we have a reason to sing. We have a reason to sing. Did you know that singing is actually good for you? There is health benefits for singing. Now, some of you, you're probably thinking, oh, there's nothing good about my singing. I know there's nothing real good about my singing, but it still is whether you sing in the shower or whether you sing on a morning walk or whether you sing in your car when you're driving to work, there's actually health benefits. I looked this up. Uh, Healthline, which is an online uh, resource for healthy living, says these things uh, are beneficial. These things will, will be a part of your health, your strengthening health, if you will sing. The first thing it says is that it relieves stress. We all have this um, stress hormone in us called cortisol, and research has shown through tests that, that this company did that those that, they, they tested those that sang and those that didn't sing, and those that sang had a reduced amount of cortisol in their saliva. So singing actually reduces stress. It also stimulates the immune response. They found that uh, through a National Institute of Health study, they found that higher levels of, and I'm going to try to pronounce this, immunoglobulin A. Did I do that right, Mary? Is that good? Does that sound right? <laughs> immunoglobulin A, which is an antibody that fights infection, um, there is, there's a higher level of that in your saliva after you, those of singing. They tested those that, that sang and those that just listened to music, and there was a higher level of that um, antibody found in those that actually sing. We also know that it increases the pain threshold. If you have a low threshold of pain, maybe some singing might be good for you. It increases the pain threshold. It improves snoring. Now, you might be thinking, well, my husband snores. I would rather listen to him snore than to singing. Whatever the case may be, if you sing, it could possibly improve your snoring. Um, it will improve lung function. That's probably common sense. Develops a sense of belonging, connection when you sing together. You remember in the old days when churches had choirs? Now we've gone to praise teams for the most part, but that actual singing together will de develop a sense of belonging, connection. Another thing it does is it enhances memory in people with dementia. I loved when I read this, this, uh, this statistic. Um, remembering lyrics was easier in a study by the Alzheimer's Foundation, the participants said that it was nice to be able to remember something. So as I get older, Kim, <laughs> um, and I can't remember some, some of the names and some of the faces and some of the places, um, hopefully I remember some of the lyrics to some of the songs. Um, it, is, it increases memory um, as we get older. It helps with grief. A group sing again provided a sense of support during grief. It improves mental health and mood. And finally, it helps improve your speaking abilities. Um, what they found in these studies is that it stimulates part of the brain. Those that have a speech impediment, singing would actually increase or make better um, that speech impairment that they had. So singing does bring good health benefits. So next time you turn on that shower, Think about that. Let it rip. Just let it go and have a good time. Because, one, we've got a reason to sing. We've been rescued. Our passage begins with an exhortation to sing. Now, who was Zeph speaking to? It was those that, if we go back and look a little bit of the history, 
Zephaniah's uh, audience was those that the Jewish nation who had turned back to God in, rep in repentance. It was that remnant of Israel who had returned to God. So they had been rescued, in essence, by God. And so Zephaniah was saying, because of that, because you've come back to God, you have a reason to sing. If you know anything about the history of God's chosen people, you know that they had this cyclical relationship with God. They would sin. God would bring some type of judgment, some type of captivity. And then through that suffering that they experienced, they would, re they would repent and they would return to God. And God would restore them. God would uh, bring a redemption to them. And as I mentioned earlier, the prophet's role was to be one, not only the voice of God, but to, to be that voice that would call his people back to him. He was to point out where they had strayed and he would call them back to repentance and back into a right relationship with God. And we have to can't minimize the fact that God had a place in this, too, because he was the one that spoke through the prophets. He was the voice of the prophet and God provided certain promises for those who would return to him. Let me give you an example of this judgment or this call to repentance and then the promise that would follow. It's a very familiar verse. Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles 7, 14 says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Now that's the call to repentance there. If my people will do this, if they will pray, if they will turn their back on, on the sin and, and they will seek my face and return from their wicked ways, this is what God's promises that follows that call to repentance. He says, I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. So the prophecies of the Old Testament kind of follow that, that, uh, that flow, if you will, where there's a call to repentance and then... God's going to fulfill a promise. In this case, calling them back to his face, calling them back to prayer. And if they would, he would heal their land. Israel's repentance always carried God's promise of healing and restoration. So what is this repentance that we talk about? What is this repentance that the, the prophets of the Old Testament were very, um, very commonly would, would call out to God's people? And we even see it in the New Testament with John the Baptist when he would call his the, the New Testament people, the, the people that were following after Christ, call them back to repentance. This idea was a recurring theme, not only in the Old Testament of the prophets, but in the New Testament as well. And it's a biblical term meaning an act of changing one's mind. Repentance is an act of changing one's mind. It is a commitment to a renewed relationship with God. And just like it was in biblical times, so today it carries this twofold meaning. Let me share that meaning with you. In scripture, we find that repentance actually is when God's spirit draws us into a relationship with him through his son, Jesus. By faith, we repent of our sin and turn to him in salvation. So we're headed down this road toward our sin. Repentance is that changing of the mind. And we turn and do an about face and we say, God, I want to repent from my sin and I'm going to turn to you. That's a, one of the pictures we get in scripture about repentance. There's also another meaning in this. Those, for those of us who have placed our faith in Christ, we've been given the spirit of God to dwell within us. And what is the role of that spirit? It is the convictor of sin. It is that, that nudging or that tapping on the shoulder that says, you know what? You don't need to be headed down that road. And so it calls us back to God through repentance. And we are headed in this way. Our sinful nature is pulling us this way. But we turn and do it about face and say, God, because of my faith in you, because of your spirit that dwells within me, I know you're calling me back to you. So I'm going to repent. I'm going to turn. I'm going to change my mind about what is wrong and place it on what is right. So there's that twofold meeting. It, it can be for those of us that turn to God in faith. At the very beginning, but it can also be a repentance for those of us of faith because when we stray, we can repent, we can confess our sin, just as 1 John 1 9 says, to confess our sin, and God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin. It's that living, breathing relationship that we have with God. 
So the prophet declares that those who had returned to God, they have reason to sing because God has rescued them. We confess our sin to God in repentance. We're given full access, just like the prophet would say, you have reason to sing. God's got great promises for you. So is the same for us when we repent of our sin. We have great promises from God throughout Scripture. Not only do we have those physical benefits that I mentioned earlier, but we have those spiritual benefits of repentance as well. And then when we recognize that, we realize we have, just like the Israelites had, just like the prophets spoke to, the, to God's people then, God speaks to us, we have reason to sing. And you probably have your own story of why you have reason to sing. You have a story of rescue. God has shown his favor. God has called you back into relationship with him. And that gives us reason to sing. Not only do we have a reason to sing, but the second point I would share with you is we have an unshakable confidence. An unshakable confidence. In that verses 15 and 16 of that, uh, those verses that I read, it says, The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. On that day they will say to Jerusalem, Do not fear, Zion. Do not let your hands Hang limp. Let me ask you a question. When have you felt most protected in life? I want you to think about that for a minute. When have you felt most protected in life? Well, why? You're probably saying, well, what does protection have to do with this unshakable confidence? Because we typically feel most confident when we are protected. Have you ever thought about that? We feel most confident when we're protected, when there is a strong sense of security that is present in our lives. When someone we know has our back or when we feel like that there's nothing that we can do that will create insecurity if we fail. We can know that even if we fail, things are going to be OK. That's when we have the most confidence in life. It's that sense of security. If I didn't share a picture with this, but you can you can. Imagine this, if you will, the father is in the pool and the three-year-old is standing on the side of the pool and the father is saying, jump. What does that child do? Without hesitation, jumps into the arms of a father or a mother. It's that picture that we have. As a, it's kind of like that childlike faith that we can jump into the arms of God knowing that God's going to catch us. We have that kind of confidence and that picture of that child jumping into a parent's arm gives us a beautiful image of the confidence that God wants us to have. The truth is that every one of us here this morning, we have faced or we're currently facing or we will face storms of this life. And it's good to know that we have someone we can count on. We have spouse, we have family members, we have friends. But here's the truth. Even in the midst of being surrounded by having people at our side, we can feel alone at times. And we can feel that we're in that storm all by ourselves. But the reality is that as followers of Christ, we're never fully alone. You and I are never fully alone by our faith in God. God has promised us in his word that he will always be with us. We will never be exempt from the difficulties of this life. Doesn't matter if we're a person of faith or we're still on the outside looking in, investigating what this faith looks like. We are all part of this world and being a part of this world, Jesus said, we will have trial, trials, we will have tribulation, but we are guaranteed God's presence in all those seasons, in all those times, all those storms of life. And that, knowing that promise, gives us an unshakable confidence. Listen to what some other passages in Scripture have to say about this promise of God's presence. Joshua 1.5 says, and just to let you know, kind of everybody knows what, what the, the book of Joshua is about. It's, it's following the death of, of Moses, and, and God had tapped Joshua on the shoulder and said, you're going to be my next leader of Israel, and you're going to lead my people into the promised land. Now, Joshua was given a great task here. 
to lead the people out of the wilderness, God's people out of the wilderness, into what he had promised to them. And so I'm sure Joshua probably had a lot of fear, probably felt unqualified at times. But God's word to him in that first chapter of Joshua, when God commissioned him, he said, no one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. That promise, I will never leave you or forsake you, is echoed in the book of Hebrews in chapter 13. It's a New Testament promise too. It's a quote from the Old Testament. And that's why I say the Old Testament, we can't you know, minimize the, the Old Testament promises because the God that promised Joshua of his presence is the same God that promises you of his presence. When you go through these storms in life, you know that you have a holy God on your side. Listen to Isaiah chapter 43, verses 1 through 3. It says, but now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, listen to his promise. I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel. God's promise that no matter what they experienced, no matter what his people experienced in life, didn't say you're not going to experience those things. He says when you pass through the waters, when you pass through those difficult times, when you experience those storms, his promise is I will be with you. You know, you may be in the midst of some dark days. And if that's true for you, I want you to remember that God's promise is true for you. His unfailing promise of his presence. I want you to do, do something. If you have a tendency to, to focus on your circumstances a little bit more, I want you to go home and write on a post-it note or write on something that... That verse in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, or if you want to look back and, and remember the, uh, the passage in Joshua, or just somewhere that God's promise of his presence, I will never leave you or forsake you. Write that on a post-it note. Put it on your dashboard in your car. Put it on your bathroom mirror so you see it every morning when you get ready for work. Put it somewhere where every day you're reminded that God's presence is promised to each of us. God will never leave us or forsake us. And his presence can provide a rescue for you from whatever situation you're facing. But the thing is, the key to that is we have to believe that in our faith. We have to see his work and we have to believe by faith that his presence will always be there. So because of the fact that God is on a rescue mission for us, we have a reason to sing. We have an unshakable confidence. But I also want you to see that we have a mighty Savior. The last part of that, those uh, verses that I read in Zephaniah say this in verse 17. It says, the Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. In this one verse, we're given a beautiful picture of God's re re rescuing love. And he speaks of three things that he's going to do for us. Three things. He says, he will take great delight in us. Did you ever think about the fact that God enjoys your presence? That's a little bit foreign to us to think that God actually wants me to be in fellowship with him. That he actually loves it when I come into his presence it says he will take great delight in us now we can take that and say well that's one scripture but did you know the new testament is full of thing, full of uh instances examples of god beckoning people to come into his presence you don't have to look any further than the disciples what did, what was Jesus' invitation to the disciples he said come follow me it was an invitation to come into the presence of a holy God through his son, Jesus Christ, to be a part of his everyday life. Come, follow me. Think about the rich young ruler. What did he say after he told him to sell all he had to when the rich young ruler said, what must I do? Jesus said, sell all you have and do what? Come and follow 
me an invitation to come and be a part of what, what was happening, this new way of doing things, to be a part of it. Don't let the distractions, the things that have tripped you up, just come and follow me. I like how Jesus invited the, the children to come. When he said, children, let the children come to me in Luke chapter 18. It was an invitation for the children to come and be a part of who he was and what he was doing. He didn't turn anybody away. He says to all of us, come. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. And what is his promise? I will give you rest. Are you carrying a burden today? Are you facing that storm? Jesus' promise is it's an invitation to come. He loves your presence. And when you are abiding in his presence and he is enjoying your presence, he will remove those burdens. Those burdens that we carry will be carried and, and be part of his burden for us. And then the promise, I think, that maybe some some of this up, uh, this fact that he enjoys our presence is that he's not going to drive us away. It says in John chapter 6, 37, it says, all those that the father has given to me will come to me and I will never drive them away. So God loving your presence through his son, Jesus, is something that he's never going to turn his back on. We talked about he's always there with us. He's not going to turn his back on us. He will never drive us away. That's that we can put that back in the unshakable confidence part because that gives us the confidence to face whatever when we know that we've got a savior that's on our side, a mighty savior. So he, he enjoys our presence. He takes great delight in us. Verse 17 goes on. It says, um, he will take great delight in you. It's, it, the New International Version says, in his love, he will no longer rebuke you. I like what the uh, ESV, the English Standard Version says, says he will quiet you with his love. Kind of, It means the same thing, but I like the wording of the ESV when it says he will quiet you with his love. What does that do for you when you hear that? For me, it, it speaks peace. He will quiet me, the anxieties that I face because of the circumstances in this life. It says he will quiet me with his love. That brings peace. When I'm in his presence and he's enjoying my presence, when I'm abiding in him and he's welcoming, welcoming me in, that gives me peace no matter what's going on externally. No matter what I'm facing in work, whatever I'm facing in my family, whatever I'm facing in a community, whatever is going on around me, I can have peace in him because it says he will quiet me with his love. I love what Philippians chapter four says, talks about that peace. It talks about a peace that passes understanding from the apostle Paul when he's right at the church at Philippi, talks about that peace that we can't even describe. And if you've been in a storm and in the middle of that storm, you know that you've got peace. You, you know what I'm talking about. People look around and go, how can you be facing that storm? How can you be going through those trials and have peace? Well, I don't know, but I just know it's there. And I can't describe it, but it's the peace of God. That's the kind of peace that the Apostle Paul talks about. It's a peace that passes understanding. And that's the kind of peace we have in the presence of God. And then the third thing he says about um, this fact that he's a mighty savior, the reason we, we know he's a mighty savior, he says, but he will rejoice over you with singing. He will rejoice over you with singing. We are, you are, I am, together, we're all part of his prized creation. He loves each of us with an unending sacrificial love. And that love, through that love, he longs to celebrate you. He wants to sing over you. So are there health benefits for God for singing? I don't know. But he likes to sing. He's singing over you today. Isn't that amazing to think that the God that created us, the God that redeemed us, the God that gave us life is also the same God that not only is praying for us to the Father right now through his Son, but it's that same God that's singing over us, no matter what we're faced. It tells us that God is passionate about us. God is on a rescue mission 24 seven. 
seeking you, seeking where you are, reminding you of his passion for you. He went to great lengths to provide a way of rescue for us. And let me share two ways that we've done that he provided a way of rescue for us. First of all, well, we can say that it's a, pre a present and a future rescue. The first thing would be present. He rescues us in everyday life. John 10, 10 says the thief comes to kill, to steal and destroy. But I, Jesus speaking, I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. Sometimes we think about our faith being something that's going to happen in the future. It's going to give us something in the future. And it will. We have the promise of eternity with Christ in heaven because of our faith. But we also have the promise of abundant life here and now. And we don't really need to lose sight of that. God wants to rescue us in everyday life. In our cycle of sin, God is mighty to save. In our storms and our trials of this life, God is mighty to save. In our struggles as a parent that nobody seems to understand, God is mighty to save. In your loss of all hope for today or tomorrow, God is mighty to save. In the loss that you experience in this life, God is mighty to save. We can continue to list different circumstances that we face in this life and follow that up with our God is mighty to save. He is mighty to rescue. So in this life, the life that we live right now, God wants to rescue you. He wants to save because he is mighty to save. But not only rescue in for your present, but he wants to rescue you for the future. He wants to secure your future in him, to rescue you for all of eternity. What is it that God came to rescue us from? The only thing that would keep us eternally separated from the holy God that we know is our sin. That sin that separates us from him. It's a familiar verse, familiar passage. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. And sometimes we read that and we don't go beyond that. We don't go to verse 17 very frequently. We commit that 16th verse to memory and we say that. It's, it's powerful and we should say it, but listen to 17. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Jesus came to save the world. He came to save you. Not only for today, but for all of eternity. Luke chapter 19, Jesus says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save, or he came to rescue that which was lost. We got pictures of it. We got, we got images of the shepherd that would leave the 99 and go rescue the one. God is passionate about the one. God is passionate about you. He's mighty to save, mighty to rescue you, not only today, but for, more importantly, all of eternity. And when we know that we're rescued for eternity, that gives us hope to live today, no matter what we face. And he calls you to put your faith in him, the only one who can rescue you and give you not only the promise of future, but abundant life today. Culture would tell us, suck it up, buttercup. You can do it. Scripture says it's already been done. The rescue has already been made. All we have to do is respond. We can't do it on our own. We surrender to the one who's already done it. As I mentioned earlier, it's a little over two weeks ago, I was a guest in the country of Chile. I was part of a teaching team that uh, our partnership conference, uh, at our partnership conference where 13 Y staffers had gone down to, uh, to speak and to be a partner to support the work of the uh, YMCA in Valparaiso, Chile, and to work on just building a strategic plan for what is coming. Um, during my week there, I had the opportunity to visit the Chilean Naval Museum located in the city of Valparaiso. And while there, I climbed up two steps into this capsule. 
And that's where this message was birthed. That capsule, and you can't really see it fully, but that capsule that we saw at the very beginning that rescued those 33 miners, I got to stand in that. You're talking about something that will shake you a little bit, wake you up to the reality of storms of life. That was the capsule that rescued the 33 miners, and it was eerie. It was an eerie feeling to stand in that small capsule that provided a way out, a way of rescue uh, for the men who had persevered under great trial. And to stand there and remember their rescue reminded me of God's rescue of me. Maybe you have, as I mentioned earlier, your own story of rescue. You could probably, if I brought this microphone around, you could probably stand and talk about your story of rescue, about how God rescued you from catastrophe. Maybe you're experiencing a storm in your journey today and, and you're praying for that rescue. Let me encourage you to hang on because God will provide the rescue. Maybe your rescue won't be as dramatic as the story of the rescue of the miners in Chile, but it's a, to you it's as powerful as what happened there. We've all been to that point in our lives where most likely we needed rescue. Maybe it was from a mistake of poor choices. Maybe you found yourself in a place you didn't intentionally plan on being. You needed help nonetheless. You needed God to rescue. It could be today that you're needing that rescue. I remind you of God's promise in our passage today, but I want to read it from a modern translation, the message. And I want to personalize it. Have you ever personalized scripture where you may take out the name of whoever is referring to it and you put your name into it? So that's what I want to do. And it's going to appear up here on, on the screen but I want to read it as if I was reading it to me. And you can read it as if you're reading it to yourself. Listen to God's promise to the Israelites, but more modern today. So sing, son. Raise your voices, my child. My child, be happy. Celebrate. God has reversed his judgments against you and sent your enemies off chasing their tails. From now on, God is your king in charge at the center. There is nothing to fear from evil ever again. You will be told, don't be afraid. Bruce, don't despair. Your God is present among you, a strong warrior there to save you. Happy to have me back. He calms me with his love and delights me. With his songs. God's promise of rescue is real, and he is on a mission for your soul. And when you realize what he's done to provide you with that present and eternal rescue, and surrender to his invitation of rescue, you will have a reason to sing. You will have an unshakable confidence and you will see just what a mighty Savior he is. Let's pray. It could be today that um, your rescue feels very far away. Would you just at this moment in this silence just just ask God to renew your faith, to give you the ability to hang on, to give you the eyes through faith to see his work. Maybe it's this morning you, you've been on the outside looking in. You're not sure what rescue is, looks like. It begins with surrender. Would you surrender your heart to him this morning? Maybe you've been living a life of faith for as long as you can remember. But you know that it's time to turn back to God and 
You have allowed the circumstances, the storms of this life to take your eyes off of him. You want to turn and make things right with him today. Whatever the case may be, just in the silence right now, just pray and ask him to, to come into your heart, to, to renew your faith, to give you a new faith. Ask him to forgive your sin. And he is faithful to do that. Just ask him to do that this morning. Father, we, we're grateful that you are on a continual rescue mission for us. Whether we've never responded to you in faith or whether we've lived our whole life of faith and we've strayed, Maybe we just need to hit the refresh button. Whatever the case is, God, we know that when you call your people to repentance, there are great promises to follow. If we repent for the first time, we have the promise of all of eternity with you. If we repent from sin, we have the promises that you will forgive and bring restoration. Thank you for that. Thank you that you are rescuing us every day. God, you are a mighty, a mighty one who saves, and we celebrate that today. Father, thank you for meeting with us here today. Um, would you take your word that has been spoken and continue to challenge us and to continue to grow our faith in you? And we will be thankful for it. I thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for those that are here today, those that may be watching online. Um, Lord, we praise you for, for your work in our lives, in this church, and in this community because of your call upon the leaders of this church. And I pray your blessings to continue uh, doing just that. And we will praise you for it. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.